Hello everyone and welcome to Football Therapist for the first episode of a special series Series as we we're going to talk about the different cognitive biases that can be found in football, starting with those that, that can be found when analyzing a match, which is why the, the use of data will be a, an important topic of this video. But first, a definition of cognitive biases. They are deviations from uh, logical thinking from our brain that lead us to process information irrationally. It may still seem complicated, but it will become much less so with the video as, well, as we will go through many examples. First is the, uh, the authority bias, um, which consists of adhering to an opinion because the person issuing it is considered intelligent or even an expert in the field. For example, in 2012, Messi's most pro prolific year in, statist in statistical terms, sorry, Pele uh, suggested that the Argentine was not yet better than, than Neymar while the latter was still playing in Brazil. Surely we would all have we would we would have all laughed at, at that statement at the time if it hadn't come from uh, one of the greatest players in in football history. And speaking of great players, they don't necessarily become great coaches. The latter being the very people who know football best and know which player is better than other uh, precisely. But authority can also lead to another bias, uh, that of belief. Uh, as an example, I, I chose the Villanovense Barcelona Cup match of uh, 2015 that ended in a fair nil-nil. The authority that Barca represents could indeed push us to, to see the match win, uh, to see the match with the, the belief that the third, divi the third division team uh, was very strong because it was the match of their life, as some would say. And since several uh, relatively important Barcelona players were lined up that night, one could well be tempted to refuse to consider the match of the then European champions uh, as, a, as a disappointment. Because even if the Catalans made many mistakes that night, some could easily be blinded by the particular context of this match. As it's the match of a lifetime for the Villanovense players, they must have prepared it for weeks, while Barcelona may not have had any video of Villanovense at, the, at their disposal. Well, it's possible. We could hear on TV that the local fans cheered their team in full voice during 19 minutes. Um, so that it so that explains their magnificent performance. Regarding the sound, it is possible, but it can also be accentuated on TV. While, Vina, while Villanovense's performance was obviously um, good for the for the level, but it was actually rather Barcelona who failed to take advantage of spaces that were often left free in the opponent's defensive block. A conclusion that is impossible to have if the authority that the name of FC Barcelona represents makes us refuse to analyze the game. Because rather than looking at, at what happened on the pitch, it is always much easier to look for other explanations that have little or, or no impact at all on, on events. It should also be noted that other biases can reinforce this disbelief, such as the illusory correlation bias. Uh, which consists precisely in perceiving a non-existent correlation between two events or in exaggerating it. As extenuating circumstances, one could imagine, for example, that the Barca players could not have been physically fit because of a relatively longer than usual journey to Extremadura, where they surely couldn't rest in a hotel as luxurious as those they normally have. This is certainly true, but it still doesn't justify the many mistakes that were made during this game. While I personally don't believe in a lack of motivation, since all the players lined up had better perform well to hope to, to get more playing time in the following games. So this erroneous vision can also be falsely reinforced by a second bias, that of confirmation. This is because well-founded information can bias us by focusing on, 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 the, on the one that confirms our, our thinking. In the case of this cup match, finding out that the Villanovense pitch is smaller than that of the big stadiums would be a confirmation bias in so far, as even with a few square meters less space, Barcelona should have done better. And the same goes for the possible uh, excuse that the pitch was in, in poor condition. But something else can deceive us. 
our position and angle of view in, in the stadium or that of the camera if we're watching the match on TV. Above is a screenshot of this famous match in, <laughs> now famous match in, in, in Villa Novense, cropped only at the top and bottom, but not in the width direction. Probably necessary because of the athletic strike that separates the, the pitch from the stadium stand. Um, this zoom prevents us from seeing the 10 outfield players of each team and can just lead us into the a priori bias. On the image in question, the ball on the left back seems a priori not to have any passing options because we, we don't see any. However, teammates could very well be free in the opponent's half, but we have no way of knowing that. From this image, it would be a mistake to draw the conclusion that Villa Novense uh, managed to disturb the scattered possession phase. Despite the zoom, uh, the spaces seem smaller, uh, especially on the far side, compared to a match filmed at Camp Now, for example, where the camera is placed much higher. This is why some coaches ask their analysts to uh, watch the game from the, from the top of the stands, actually, uh, if possible, in, in order to see details that would be less obvious from, from the edge of the pitch. So this search for and this search for, for an alter, alternative viewpoint sometimes also takes place at training sessions where the use of drones is increasingly common. Some coaches, uh, however, prefer to be located high up themselves, such as Luis Enrique, who is known for who's known um, to ask for, for a tower to be to be built at his team's training center, for instance. The interpretation of statistics, uh, even those uh, considered advanced, is also um, affected by this bias. Thinking in particular of the comparison of the normal uh, of the total number of expected goals or um, xj that two teams can generate during a match, because a, a priori, the the one who managed to produce a higher value seems to to have deserved to to win, since this metric measures the, the danger of each shot on, on a scale of, of one to, to uh, of, of nil to one. The higher the value of a shot, the more it, it should end up into the net. Except that in order to know who objectively uh, deserves more to win a match, we should not compare the totals of this statistic, but examine it uh, by trying examine them by trying to to understand the course of the match. Perhaps the the team that won one Nil has significantly, significantly fewer XGs, but simply didn't need them because they, they scored very early and then defending, defend, uh, defended in a low block. Situation that causes many opponents troubles, especially those who do not have players who are really uh, dangerous when, when receiving crosses. It's therefore quite conceivable that the losing team actually has a, a much higher total expected goals uh, value simply because they took a large number of shots uh, from distance that were not actually that dangerous, not to mention uh, that the winner may have had several very dangerous dangerous crosses that simply didn't result in a shot and therefore didn't result in, in an XG value just for a delay of a few milliseconds or an inaccuracy of only a few centimeters. So to combat the a priori bias in this situation, it would be better to look at the, at the timing chart of, of the XGs uh, of the match in question. The total in question is automatically updated after each shot, and as the goals are also indicated, it is possible to guess how the, the two teams behaved uh, depending on the score and, and the time remaining. Ideally, uh, one, one would combine the, this graph with a bar graph similar to, to the one already used to, to represent the control of the game. For this purpose, um, an XG map showing the shot's location and the value could also be interesting. So, in the end, the key is to know how to, improve, uh, how to interpret not only the expected goals, but all the statistics, uh, always keeping in mind that there are different models to, to measure the same metric, which explains, for, for example, the different total XG values that can be found for, for the same match. These statistical models and views uh, derived from them, such as expected points in, in this case, actually still, needs, uh, still need to be refined to, to gain importance, perhaps, by, perhaps here by individualizing them according to the quality of the player and goalkeeper in each uh, shooting situation. Such a tool, uh, which seeks to ensure that 
our reading of the match is not biased by the doesn't get biased by by the result indeed must itself be used wisely and ideally combined with the use of other met other metrics and i'm thinking of the expected threat or xt um, here for example that's it for me don't hesitate to subscribe to subscribe to my channel to make sure you don't miss the, the second episode of this series and as well as other similar content and if you like the video don't forget to drop me a like, tell me in the comments and share the video with another, with another football nerd. It really helped me a lot more than you think. Bye bye.